My name is Alan Lightman. I'm a scientist and a writer. My family has a home on a small island in Maine. The island has no roads or bridges, and there's no ferry service. One summer night in the wee hours, I was coming back to the island in my boat. I was alone on the water. I was captivated by the quiet and the stars overhead. I decided to turn off the engine. I lay down in the boat and looked up. After a few moments, my world dissolved into that star-littered sky. The boat disappeared, my body disappeared, and I found myself falling into infinity. I felt as if I were part of the stars. I was merging with something much larger than myself. And the vast expanse of time, extending from the far distant past, long before I was born, and then into the far distant future, long after I'll be gone, seemed compressed to a dot. What was happening to me? As a scientist, I used to think that everything could be reduced to numbers. But at that moment in the boat, I believe you could have hooked up every neuron in my brain to a giant computer, and all of that data wouldn't have come close to explaining my experience. After a time, I sat up and started the engine again. And so began my personal journey to understand how these different worlds relate. The world of atoms and molecules and the world of complex human experiences. In a material and impermanent cosmos in the age of science, what is it that has meaning? and how can we find it? From a cosmic perspective, we're straddling the vast range from the sphere of the atom to the realm of the sky. Let's push even further to see where we humans fit in the cosmos. What's the farthest of the far and the smallest of the small? Today, our quest for the smallest things occurs in giant accelerators that smash subatomic particles together to see the even smaller and simpler pieces they're made of. Finding those pieces also tells us about the fundamental forces of nature just as we can learn how an automobile engine works only by understanding its most basic parts. I'm in the cornfields here, and behind me is Mont Blanc. And underneath my feet, about one football field down, is a section of the giant ring of the CERN particle accelerator, which goes around in a circle 17 miles Particles are accelerated up to a speed of 99.9999999% the speed of light. And going at that speed, in just a few hours that they're in the ring, they travel a distance equal to 100 times from the Earth to the Sun. 
It's always struck me as a kind of poetic irony that to search for the smallest particles in nature, we need the biggest machines. Well, because if you want to look at the uh, fundamental constituent of matters, you need a lot of energy. And uh, to produce a lot of energy, you need big, big machine. You need a 27 kilometer ring filled with technology. So this uh, magnet can generate roughly 100, it's 100,000 times the Earth's magnetic field. Yeah. Earth. So this is the most powerful single unit superconducting magnet in the world. So if you have a very energetic particle, it will travel almost straight. But the magnetic field can literally help us determine the momentum. So there may be protons coming together every 25 billionth of a second. And it's also the pattern of these interactions as the particles go through that allows you to say, you know, this looks like an electron because it showers like this. This looks like a proton because I see almost nothing and then a big shower. Yeah. So it's these patterns that allow us to distinguish different types of particles. On the other side of the CERN ring is the Atlas detector, also giant. Melissa Franklin was the first woman to get tenure in the physics department at Harvard. She's an experimentalist who loves to build instruments to measure elementary particles. It's a beautiful lab. It's, it is the you know, premier lab in the world right now, the highest energy accelerator. It has many, many buildings with a million doors, and inside of each door is some really knowledgeable person about something. I work on an experiment that has 3,000 physicists. We say 3,000, but we don't actually have any idea. That's without engineers, technicians, working together to build an enormous detector uh, that, that's going to look every 25 nanoseconds. Atlas and CMS and all the other detectors at CERN are controlled from one central location. Wow, this, this is incredible. This is the nerve center of the largest scientific experiment in the world, a monument to human civilization. All the electrical and magnetic fields needed to make the particles go round and round and round, keeping the thing running. And it was here, after years of effort, false starts, equipment repairs and upgrades, that the Higgs particle was found in 2012. The Higgs is needed to give most other fundamental particles a bit of mass. Particles without mass travel at the enormously high speed of light. The Higgs particle slows them down like an invisible molasses filling up space. In addition, the Higgs is required by modern theories that unify the forces of nature. So we really needed the Higgs particle to exist. And it was found at CERN nearly 50 years after its prediction. You know, it's not a nine to five thing where you carry a briefcase. It's exciting in how intense it is. The thought, the work, the, the stuff, every, there's every scale. My experiment is, you know, five stories high and yet we have to look at tiny little bonds of tiny little things in order to solder tiny little things in order to make it work. We're on every scale. Physically, we're on every scale mentally. Like, everything we do is connected with understanding the Big Bang and understanding how the universe came about. I mean, it's just mind-bogglingly big intellectually. And it's very, very satisfying physically. That's why I do it. Along with the experimentalists who love to build the detectors, CERN needs theorists to do the math and ponder the implications of the results. You go down there and, you know, as someone who has been in many cathedrals in Europe and in churches in the States, it has a very similar feeling because it's this massive expanse and is filled with hours and hours and hours of human time and thought and contributions. And that, that's what a cathedral is. At CERN, Melissa was part of a large team that helped determine the mass of the top quark, a subatomic particle predicted in the same year the Higgs was predicted. 
does it matter to you what you're measuring? I mean, do you get as much pleasure measuring somebody's shoe size as measuring the mass of a subatomic particle? I like the act of measurement. <laughs> I feel compelled to measure. So it's more satisfying to measure something about, you know, to, to find the top quark and measure its mass, which is gonna be there forever, and it's gonna be in a little book, or I guess they won't have books anymore, but it's gonna be somewhere forever, that measurement. Um, thinking back, that's very satisfying. We collide particles together and we try and make new particles. That's very fun. But what that has led us to is to try and understand what's happening when nothing is there. When you, when you go to smaller and smaller scales, higher and higher energies, get closer and closer to nothingness, does the world get simpler or more complicated? The more things happen, that is, the higher and higher energy you go, the vacuum comes alive. It's like it's a after hours party. <laughs> You know, like, all of a sudden it's jumping, you know. You get higher and higher in energy and it really brings it alive. The richness comes out. It's like, uh, it's like nighttime is the right time. <laughs> CERN is an amazing place with gargantuan machines studying the smallest particles in nature. But what impresses me just as much is, is the passion of all the people I've met here. They love what they do. They don't love it because they're getting high salaries or because they're working on better washing machines. They love it because they're on a quest for pure knowledge. They don't care whether it's dinner time or whether it's five o'clock or whatever. They're just going to do something and they're going to get it done. I think this is this idea that life is wonderful when you forget all of the sort of normal things about life and you can just follow one desire, one thought. I find this um, adventure uh, that is not only a scientific adventure, but also a, a human adventure, because when you have to work with many people, you have to respect everyone, you have to be tolerant, you have to confront yourself with different cultures. And this is really, for me, you know, working in experiments like, like Atlas has been really uh, not only a lesson of, for, of science, but also a lesson for, for life. The thing about physics is you can have all the interesting questions of a philosopher, but then you can actually measure something. But philosophers can't measure anything. I really feel bad for philosophers. Are, are we there yet in terms of finding the most fundamental particles? We don't know. You know, that's the thing about measuring things, is you can only measure what you can measure. So, for instance, if I say, how big is a quark? Quarks, you know, what make up protons. How big is a quark? We go, well, we can only tell you down to this level. That's all we can reach. Um, we're never going to be able to reach all the way down, like to the bottom. And we're kind of in this awkward situation where we don't really know what's around the corner. There could be new physics just around the corner, or there might not be. So it's a really complicated puzzle, um, but it's a puzzle that's better than like Rubik's Cube because in the end, you have meaning. You know something about, you know, the universe. What we're doing here is not really any different from what early, you know, early humans were doing. We just have better technology because we're able to build upon, you know, what everyone else did before. But it's, in some sense, the, the same thing as we're just trying to find out how our universe works to try and find our place in it. You once said that, that the kind of work that you, that you do and, and physics improves the quality of life. But to find the mass of the top quark, how does that improve the quality of life. This is the good thing about science, and I think, in a way, this is the best argument. Everybody's interested in something different. If we support everybody working on the things they're really interested in, somehow what comes out is something really interesting, right? We, we can't tell that the MNRA vaccine would have come if some people hadn't just been following their interests, right? So each one of these things, even though maybe 
it doesn't directly, you know, result in you living longer or you having a faster car or whatever. Uh, it adds to the possibility of our brains. A big question I have is whether there are particles even smaller than quarks. Does the process of reducing nature to smaller and smaller particles go on indefinitely to the infinitely small?